That's that's uh, that's Wade's way of saying that uh, I have had a cough for many days, and I'm uh, just kind of on the tail end of it. But I I am going to start hacking up a lung at some point during this show. I guarantee you. Children are evil, and they're trying to kill us all. Yeah, you know, it's been an unbelievable sick season. It really has. Yeah, it's been yeah. Crazy. Everybody. I mean, uh, you know, my wife and daughter were sick in December. And then they were sick again in January, and I escaped both of those. And then they got sick again this month, and I finally caught that one. And uh, everybody else I know has been sick two or three times. Our buddy Ray has an upper respiratory thing that he's been fighting while he's been doing the uh, Penn yeah. & Teller show. Also, also, also the father of an evil child trying to kill him. Yeah. Uh, dragging it, around these diseases, just throwing them at us, just throwing them at us. Unreal. Me? I have been safe over here. You, well, you know, well, my little my little cousin Nandi was here. Yeah. She was sick. And you know, I'm teaching up at the university, and all sure. my students, every single one, you know, I have 14 young ladies yeah. I'm teaching, every single one of them, amazing, got hit hard. With it's unreal. And and I don't know, you know, you hear this thing when you're sick, stay home, stay home. It's okay. They send me these notes, you know, I got Professor Cogshell, of it, you know, and I said, <laughs> I'm like, good, don't come, you know, just don't get, just be over there. I'll send you the thing. Don't worry. Oh no, it's okay. And they they drag in the schools. I you know, I, just, I didn't want to miss the thing. I'm like, no, <laughs> it's okay. You were just that's fine. You could just don't come here. Yeah. Don't touch me. Mm-hmm. You know, stay away from me. It's just you know, I'm sorry, people. Stay away from me yeah. when you're dragging your diseases around. It is very true, it's and and terrible. my da- my daughter begins kindergarten in oh. uh, in August, and I I fully recognize that that is those are the that, plague years. That is the petri dish where all of the all the the the, the germs and the nasty creepy crawlies uh, circulate. So you know I what just, is great though, yeah, you, you know your 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 daughter, yeah. uh, 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 Ray's daughter. Yeah. Those kids are going to be um, uh, immune to everything. I n- hope so. N- nothing is going to be able to take those kids out. I hope so. You know, we're weak. Our generation was the weak one. Yeah. Yeah. The generation before ours was not so good either. Polio got them. Yeah. It, you know, kind of shook them I, up. I we, remember, we came out a little bit tougher. I remember when uh, chicken pox just blew That's through us. Our, That's I, me. That's you. That's yeah. our generation. Chicken pox would just take us out, man. I remember that so well. Everybody got hit in elementary school. I remember. Mumps. Uh, remember mumps? Did, yeah. Did you guys have that out in the did West Did not Coast? have mumps. We didn't have mumps. We had mumps in the Midwest. That was a terrible thing. Uh, rubella was insane for some reason. You know where I learned about mumps? measles? Oh measles. My God, that measles. was my mother's generation. Mm. And my mother, my mother was a polio victim as well, so oh, she yeah. suffered polio. And and I remember she said that you know my mother grew up on a little farm in Germany, and uh, you know three siblings, two girls, two boys, and anytime one of them got something, and measles was the example she gave. My grandfather apparently locked them all in a room so they'd all get it. Yeah. Which, if you think about, I mean, I understand that that's a very kind of old world 19th century thing to do. They probably did that all through Victorian yeah. England and Edwardian England as well. But my gosh, that's cruel. <laughs> you can, that's horrible. You can, that is unethical. It's can, so unbelievably <laughs> awful. But you know what? Yeah. I, they knew something. Yeah. Got to get these kids uh, yeah. uh, and strengthen them up yeah. and that kind of thing. Anyway, here okay. we are. Here we are. Yeah. Sorry. So, so much for that. Mm. Well, uh, movie-wise, not a whole lot going on except for the fact that Black Panther continues to be the uh, the only game in town. It's really insane. It's Blue just just crushed uh, Tomb Raider. Feel so bad for that. Undead Wrinkle in Time, same studio, yeah. but you know, yeah, tough for Ava DuVernay and Oprah yeah. and, and that crew. You know, what do you think? What do you think the issue? I mean, see, I, I a lot of people kind of saw that coming. Mm. They said, you know what? Not only is it kind of not quite like they, it's it's stunt casting of a director. I don't blame her. I think Ava, you take that payday. Absolutely, take that payday, take that option, and she's going to, you know, do a do a yeah. big Marvel thing or a DC thing DC next. Thing, she's doing yeah, a DC yeah. thing, uh, but take that payday for sure. But uh, a lot of people at the time just said, you know what, this book is not adaptable. Yeah, it uh, there's no way you make this into any kind of movie, and uh, Ava DuVernay just has. Uh, She's got a little bit too much of an edge to to bring the the, the to bring the family thing to this. You know, yeah, it's stunt yeah. casting. She's the name, right? She's suddenly a name. We can make it. We can attach her. We get the movie made. Whether or not she's the right director for it doesn't make sense. And, and I don't think that. Well, for one thing, I don't think there is a right right director for it. That's the thing. You know, I don't think anybody would have done just, it. You know, I, I I read I've read that book. It's uh it's difficult material. Yeah. Uh, combining all kinds of ideas, religious ideas with uh, scientific ideas, quantum physics, and it's all kinds of, of stuff. It's it, it's a book that is designed, and I'll I'll tell you another one in a second that's designed the same way. It's a book that's designed to work because everyone is going to put themselves into it. Everyone is going to project themselves into the stuff in that book, 
And when you have a filmmaker projecting their vision up there, that then now you're disconnected. Which is, of course, necessary for a filmmaker to do. And here's another book from... Which is why some books are books. Yes. And here's another book from the same era, the exact same era, which suffers from a lot of the same problems when you see the movie version. Uh, Jonathan Livingston Siegel. Yeah. Uh, okay. Indeed, yeah. Now, that was one that we had to read in school, and uh, I thought it was okay. You know, I, I, I kind of got it, but, but the idea of there being a movie of that was just always completely bizarre. Yeah, it, it, some of them are, are like Cloud Atlas, David Mitchell's Cloud uh, uh, Atlas. I remember reading yes. that book, which was amazing to me. I think it came in second uh, for the Man Booker or something like that. And I yeah. thought, if this came in second, I got to read the, bu- the book, the I, one, the one brilliant I, book, genius book, that movie, The Sisters. Uh, yeah. Uh, and no, no. Yeah. Tom Hanks, Halle Berry, all of that, yeah. all the money in the world, no, yeah. no. And I and they and they and they said it was said of that book, not adaptable. Yeah. Uh, it's not. So, and it won't be the next time they try either, yeah. <laughs> no matter who the hell the director is. Very true. Is. It just does, it's not a book that's constructed that way. Well, as long as we're talking about things that are, uh, that are unadaptable, uh, <laughs> <laughs> this, our, this is our, our segue to get into some anime, <gasps> which is always fun, uh, because this stuff just bedazzles me like, like mad. Some of this stuff just really just puts me over the edge. Uh, beautiful animation, but I, I, may, I have such a hard time making sense of a lot of these worlds. However, it is always a fun thing to uh, dip into and see what's going on. And, you know, the first one here, I, I've got to say, this is, this is one of the most off-the-wall pieces of anime you're ever going to see. It is, uh, it is totally un-anime-like. It, is, it feels much more of a piece with what's going on right now in, in Europe, actually, uh, with a lot of Eastern European and certainly French animation. And uh, I think this is really, really interesting. It's called The Life of Budori Gusuko. Uh, this is a Sente release from uh, Section 23. And um, it's, it's, it's just a it, – it basically takes place in a in – a, I mean, we're talking about like, a, like, a, like cat characters, okay? This is all anthropomorphized animals. You know I hate that. I know you do. <laughs> I know you can't stand it. Uh, you know, kind of like a – yeah, I mean, these are, these are cat people. But um, it's sort of um, – it's, it's a little Pinocchio-like. If you imagine cat like – like kind of a Japanese Pinocchio done mm. a little bit European style with cat people. Mm. That's what this is. Yeah, well, you know. I, anyway, uh, it is – but it's mystical and it's cool and it's just completely unusual. And uh, based on a, a, a book or a graphic novel by Kenji Miyazawa – it is. It is really, really quite a thing to watch. Uh, it's. It's. It's just beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. It's very. There's kind of a Dickensian quality to it, which I guess there is to Pinocchio as well. That uh, that art design really yeah. is lovely. It's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it? I mean, that's it's beautiful. So that, that sort of vignettes and frames <clears throat> and those. And that, right. It's dark. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's just lovely. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it doesn't have because you're dealing with anthropomorphized animals. You're not dealing with a lot of the uh, the caricature design that is so common in anime, where you know you just go, oh, everybody, everything looks like Astro Boy. Yeah, definitely not Pixar either. No, no. <coughs> there we go. That's the first That's cough. That's the baby. That's the baby. All right, complete collection. Uh, I, this is so weird that Sente does this sometimes because when they say the complete collection. But they tack it onto a season. It's not the complete collection. It's the complete collection of the second season. That doesn't make any sense. It's not a complete collection. Stop doing that. Uh, anyway, another one from Sente is uh, Haikyuu, two exclamation points. Second season, 25 episodes on three discs. Uh, you know, we've talked about this in the past. This is, uh, you know, this is basically at volleyball. Like, anime has that whole class of where everything is high school oriented. Girls in uniforms, boys in uniforms. Some of them are superheroes. Some of them are witches. Occasionally, they're vampires. They may save the world, or they may just be dealing with boyfriend and girlfriend problems. Whatever. But they're, but they're always sexy. They're always <laughs> sexy. Well, anyway, uh, this one takes a uh, a sports angle, and this is uh, all, you know volleyball is the background of this, and uh, it, it it's the, I, this is not the most easily accessible, but it is uh, it is certainly really really well drawn. But it's very traditional anime. Uh, that's Haikyuu second season. And uh, then we get uh, Girlish Number, the complete collection. Now, um, I always kind of start to feel guilty when I actually like some of these because I start to feel a little bit like a perv. <laughs> I, I do because, you know. Mean, you, that just means they're working. They're, <laughs> I guess those, it is. The directors are all very happy. Uh, yeah. 
So uh, th- th- this is just, you know, really, really kind of, it, it gets into the, the overly cute and adorable uh, variety of anime. But uh, it follows a girl who wants to be a, a voice actor and who's unbelievably ridiculously cute. And it just kind of gets between all the lines of uh, some of these nuances of the Japanese uh, film and animation industry in kind of a self-reflexive, self-commentating way. Uh, it, it's, it's fine. It's perfectly fine. There's nothing really novel about it. It's just, uh, it's just a chance for the animators to do something a little bit cute. Not terribly well written, but uh, boy, I'll tell you, the girls just really... <laughs> the, the, the girl, I mean, look oh at my it. gosh, it's this is fantastic. Right? Uh, I, I just have no idea how to pronounce this, so I'm going to do my best. This is another complete collection, season two. Why did I do that? Uh, Chih- Chihayafuru. Chihayafuru, season two. Uh, and uh, this is all about the, uh, this is a little bit more about the, uh, again, it takes place in school, and it is a sports-oriented thing. Um, and the sport in this case is uh, Karuta. Now, Karuta is a. Uh, are you familiar with Karuta, Tim? I don't know Karuta. What the heck is so, Karuta? So it, we're talking about a martial art. Uh, no, we're, we're talking about a a game. It's like a card game. Okay. Oh, a card. Um, okay. Yeah. It's and, and what's interesting about it is I had to, I had to look this up because I always thought like you know all right playing cards Europe Mahjong is uh, mm. is is Asian and it's all they're both gambling games of chance and that's the thing that's the cultural division. And then you're watching this, and, and, and it's very much kind of, um, uh, there's like a Casino Royale thing going on. I'm thinking, you guys are playing card games in high school? That's a pretty, anyway, <laughs> so here's the deal. It's a little bit, I mean, it's a little bit hard to, to, to access this whole, you know, the way that they, you know, the whole card shark thing. But uh, apparently the deal is, is that Karuta is a card game that was introduced by the Portuguese mm. back like five, six hundred years ago. And um, it, it, you have to l- probably research it a little bit because otherwise it'll make absolutely no sense. But um, you need to know a little bit about the game. Research the game, Karuta, K-A-R-U-T-A, and then you'll, you'll probably be able to uh, pick up on it a little bit. Uh, real quickly, we also have Initial D Legend 2 Racer from Sente. Uh, Initial D is, you know, kind of, uh, it's the, it's what, uh, it's what, uh, a speed racer has kind of turned into for this yeah. generation. It's not as good, but it's it's perfectly fine. <coughs> yeah, it's the baby. Boy, I'm still coughing it up a, a, like a storm. Uh, my teen romantic comedy Snafu, complete series collection, 26 episodes. Uh, girls in uniform in schools uh, and running a services club. No, it's not as dirty as you think it is. Uh, it, it's uh, they they do things like you know uh, bacon cookies and. Um, Trying to save the world, uh, it, it's uh, it, it it you know it 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 is what it is. I I can't say this is the the greatest thing in the world, but it's got its moments and it has a follower. Uh, Hunter X Hunter Hunter Phantom Rouge is out in a Blu-ray DVD combo set as well. This is from Viz Media. Um, the you know the whole Hunter uh, Hunter X Hunter thing is also has a really really big following. It's really super cool animation, extremely well drawn, very good. This is a feature from that world, and uh, I have not kept up on this enough to necessarily follow this very well, so I'm going to opt out and say I didn't, I, I can respect it from an animation standpoint, mm. but I think you, you probably have to be a little bit more immersed in the whole, the whole scene, in man. the whole scene yeah. to really, uh, really get the vibe. Get the rest of this here, and then uh, the last bunch from Funimation. We have Yuri on Ice. This is the uh, Complete Collection Special Edition, which comes with a booklet. And, uh, you know, the Winter Olympics are just finished, so I guess you can probably... The Japanese did really, really well, and you understand that uh, figure skating is a really big deal in Japan. And uh, this is, you know, this apparently has been a huge, huge deal in uh, in Japan. Uh, Johnny Weir who was flaunting his whatever and all of his glory during the uh, Olympic coverage, is a huge fan of this. 
so, you know, Johnny Weir is certainly one of the more flamboyant figures in the yeah. sports world. I'm sorry. I, I you know, the Olympics we just yeah. did with the yeah. hair. Now yeah. he's just a, yeah. Because you know like, what? Otherwise, he, I don't give a damn about skating. I don't either. That was <laughs> so, the only so, reason anybody watched yeah, it was yeah, to so, see what Johnny Weir um, was doing with his hair yeah, and his clothes. Yeah, this guy, this guy got me watching skating, so he wins. There you go. Uh, anyway, he's a big fan of this, and you can tell why. There's a lot of Johnny Weir in this, the flamboyance and the drama and the melodrama and whatnot. So it's uh, it's uh, figure skating on ice, anime style, Yuri on Ice, the really cool collector's edition. The booklet's great, too. And then the last bunch from Funimation, uh, we have Tales of Zestiria the X, Season 2. This is a Blu-ray DVD combo set. Uh, th- again, this is a uh, this takes place in a this is a, a mystical world, a uh, kind of more of that uh, magical, mystical, mythical stuff. Um, if you haven't been following it, if you didn't catch up on season one, you're going to be totally lost. Season two, but it's pretty cool. There's some uh, there's some really kind of fun stuff that they do. Trickster Part Two uh, is detective stuff. This is uh, you don't necessarily have have to have seen the first part. You can you can dig this. This is kind of a little bit of a like a Hardy Boys kind of thing, solving mysteries. Um, some good action in this, some decent animation, not top notch, but it's more about the writing than anything else. That's Trickster Part Two, also Blu-ray and DVD combo. And then we have a uh, Jintama, G I N T A M A, Series Three Part One. Uh, this is alien invasions during feudal Japan. I haven't seen that before. I uh, haven't really followed. <laughs> you seriously. know what? I don't think I have either. I'm, 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 I'm thinking alien feudal Japan. alien. Inv- nope, nope. Definitely haven't seen an alien invasion. Damn it! <laughs> yeah. I hate it when somebody fixes something. I know, and you know, in anime, it's pretty hard to do something that hasn't been done. Before. I'm telling you, bro. That's crazy. Yeah, there's just so so many of them. Anyway, a- so you know, aliens have taken over the shogunate, and uh, it it. Uh, and then, and then it just and then it just cakes completely. I'm, weird. I'm simply never going to let anybody tell me I, I I have a bad idea for a, if for anything ever again. If somebody yeah. says that's not a good idea, Tim, dude, I know a story where aliens <laughs> take over. Anyway, go on. Anyway, well, the the, the funny thing is it, it it gets a little slapsticky at times. You're kind of like, where is that coming from? But yeah, whatever. Uh, we also have Handshakers, the complete series, Blu-ray and DVD combo pack. Uh, which is, this is a high school thing with a, with a supernatural element to it, but uh, as you know, there's like a billion of those, but um, it has a it has a really kind of a weird religious existential mm. through line to it that uh, that is is pretty interesting. I only watched a few of these, but this one I may I may watch the the whole way through. This is actually you, it like it's it's trying to sort of ask some big questions, some mm. big existential questions, and answer them, which I thought was really interesting. And then uh, Kiss Him, Not Me, the complete series, also Blu-ray and DVD. Uh, this is, uh, hold on, kind of cough. Oh, <coughs> oh, oh there, 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 there Oh, this is going to be a fun show. <laughs> Seriously, it's a good thing we didn't do this like three days ago. Oh, dude, dude, you, 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 got, I, you, you that was work. You sounded It bad. was awful. I yeah. talked to you on the phone. Yeah. I think I got one sentence in in like five minutes. <gasps> Horrendous. Uh. Just the worst. Uh, so, so, okay, so, uh, Kiss Him, Not Me, the complete series. So, here's what's funny about this. Uh, again, this gets into, you know, the, the politics of school and students. I have to wonder, you know, is this what Japanese kids do when they come home, just watch tons of anime about themselves? Mm-hmm. Anyway, uh, th- what's funny about this is there's a whole angle in here uh, between all the teen dating stuff that deals with um, with anime characters that the anime characters like. So there's anime inside the anime, which I thought was just kind of weird and amusing at the same time. <laughs> I love that idea, though. Yeah, you know. That's kind of lovely. It, and there, there are a few others that have done stuff like that, so uh, it's all right. And then uh, Bungo Stray Dogs Season 1, Blu-ray DVD combo. Uh, the This is detective stuff again. But with um, with kind of a, a supernatural animist quality to it, uh, which is very sort of uh, ancient, mythical, all over uh, Asia. Lots of uh, there are a lot of uh, animist um, myths and stories and tales that they're kind of trying to weave into this. Uh, cat people kind of derives a little Ooh. bit from from that sort of uh, tradition. Anyway, it's okay. Uh, it wasn't my favorite thing. Bungo Stray Dogs. I kind of that's a little a little bit tiresome. 
Uh, and then we also have uh, Fairy Tale Dragon Cry. That is a new feature film and a Blu-ray DVD combo set from the uh, from the Fairy Tale T A I L uh, universe. It's okay. It's not quite the same as the series. It doesn't uh, it doesn't punch all the same buttons, but uh, it's okay. Uh, D Gray Man. That's D period Gray hyphen Man. Remember, anime. You have to spell the title exactly as they do even if the punctuation is all over the map. Mm. Uh, D. Gray Man, Season 4, Part 1. For some reason, the D. Gray Man stuff never comes out on Blu-ray. It's all on DVD only. I must have done some research on that for, for some reason. Uh, so that, that saga continues. And then lastly, uh, Chaos Child. Now that's Chaos Semicolon Child. Okay. No spaces. Okay. Mm-hmm. Swig of Water. So Which is I... a great title, actually. Yeah, it is, actually. It would be a, a better title without the weird punctuation. Yeah. Uh, and this is, uh, th- again, this is detective stuff. So this is detective stuff about with, uh, with, a, with, with a, uh, a bunch, kind of a newspaper club, right? Amateur journalists. And uh, looking to basically uh, figure out uh, who, who's responsible for a series of horrible crimes. Uh, serviceable, well-written for the most part, but uh, nothing extraordinary. So... That's anime. It. Yuri on Ice, I got to say, is is the one that I, I think really stands out. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. It's a lot of just weird, freaky fun. So, And then you can just, like, uh, you know, dig the outfits, yeah. uh, too. I'll yep. knock off a few of these uh, uh, lovely films. Uh, oh, L- the LGBT stuff. The LGBT stuff. While you uh, while you drink some water over there. Yeah. Including this, I, I really like this Finnish, uh, this little Finnish uh, drama, uh, romantic drama. Um, you know, I mean, most of these films are kind of the same. Usually they're about, uh, you know, young uh, men uh, trying to find themselves or slightly older men trying to find themselves or really old men older men trying to find younger men (laughs) trying to find younger men trying to find themselves (laughs) Uh, uh, and uh, and and helping them uh, there but so what the heck you know that's what it is so a lot of this just simply comes down to how the stories sort of play out because uh, very often the stories are more or less the same including this one strews which is a lovely little finished film uh, a high school level, so very young man. Uh, a, a young kid throws a wild party when his when his parents go away. They come home and find out about it, and to punish him, they make him spend the summer with right. them. <laughs> Isn't it funny when you know punishing your child is making them stay with you? True. <laughs> that's, that's just funny to me. Uh, but of course, love will find a way. And out at the cottage, there's a boy who lives over across the thing, and you know that's gonna that's gonna take care of itself. This has some absolutely extraordinarily beautiful photography. And it, uh, in, including those sort of beautiful Finnish uh, skylines and sunsets, uh, the, the, the golden hour. Depending on where you are in the world, uh, these things don't always look the same. Um, uh, and uh, this this film takes advantage of that. So it's a lovely little film with extended scenes and the commentary uh, uh, by the directors and some of the actors on it too. That's this is from uh, TLA releasing, uh, by the way. Uh, mm-hmm. Revival would move it up a notch. So these this slightly older uh, uh, gay men in this film. One of them uh, is the son of a preacher, and he and he knows he's gay, but he's he's he, you know that he sort of like set that aside so that so, so that he can engage in his calling uh, to to be a preacher. And he's gone home to to take over his father's church, and a and a drifter comes through town. Uh, and of course, it's it's his intent to try to help this drifter find his way uh, to the Lord. But you know, other things happen, mm-hmm. uh, and it's actually pretty good. This is it's a thriller, is what this is, and it, and and it has a hell of a twist in it uh, that I will not give away here. But it's a good movie in that context. So all other content notwithstanding, this is just a damn good little thriller. Cool. Uh, I like that quite a lot. Uh, and then we have well, this this little comedy. Documentary, uh, uh, Jesus meets a gay man, and what it what it what it what it what it attempts to do in a sort of Jesus Christ superstar kind of way with bad costumes and uh, is 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 uh, uh, think about that question: What would have happened if Jesus had met a gay man? And this is what I think is funny. What? How the hell do they know Jesus didn't meet any gay guys? How do they know, <laughs> I mean, how do they know Jesus didn't have a homie right over there, gay as hell? They don't know. Um, uh, it, but you know, it's 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 funny. So what the hell? That's a good one for Easter, I guess. Yeah, yeah, creeping up on Easter. Now this, Voyage, a film by Scud. Scud is just sort of uh, 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 an Asian director who uh, does really these art films. They're really works of art as Mm -hmm. much as they are uh, cinema, uh, narrative cinema. They are narrative cinema. They are storylines, but they're really about much, much more. This is a lovely, lovely film. Uh, a, A young psychiatrist goes on this trip. He's on this journey. And he has depression. He's trying to overcome his depression. And while he's out at sea, he starts talking to and recording 
the spirit. Oh, who's trying to call me? Somebody's trying to call me. It's my mom. My mom. Sorry, mom. <laughs> in a minute, mom. In a minute. Um, the spirit. The spirits of people who have sailed on that ship, and it's really sort of ethereal and beautiful mm-hmm. and very. Flu- it's kind of Ozui. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, in, in that sort of a way. It's nice. And it's and it's just lovely. It's just lovely. There's a lot of nudity in it. Frontal nudity of both men and women. But you know, it's it's not, it's just not about that at all. It's really just about the way these people feel as they're trying to get over the whatever it is that's depressing them a little bit. So it's a lovely film. Uh, Voyage, a film by Scud. Scud. Yeah. Just Na- named after the missile, or is the <laughs> missile named after him? Uh, he's, uh, the missiles are older. <laughs> All right, so now we're going to get into some new movies. We are still in uh, in Oscar territory here. Yeah, and, they're, coming uh, out. they're coming out for everybody now. And we have the, the we have the uh, the 4K Ultra HD release of the film that won Best Picture, The Shape of Water by Guillermo del Toro. Uh, and uh, film that neither one of us particularly liked. It, well, you know, here's the thing, and, and that's where this is worth talking about. I, I'm gonna rec- I'm still gonna recommend oh, this sure. because it's such a beautifully put together movie. If you you can learn a lot about. Here's the thing. Uh, one of my big gripes, and I know yours too, mm. is that is that as as film, one reason that people don't go to the movies as much is because you you're you're not sort of awed by the the process anymore. Now it is so democratized that it, not only can everyone do it, but everyone knows how to do it. Mm-hmm. So you have five year olds and six year olds who are doing you know uh, animation work on their computers and editing it, and then doing the voiceover and then submitting it to festivals and winning awards. If a five year old can do this stuff, then you know, and kids are making their own movies on their with their phones and their computers, then suddenly the whole process is no longer mystical and out of reach and, and fascinating. So feature films have not tried to sort of keep up with that. They've gotten lazy. Mm. And filmmakers, we just saw a movie the other day, right, where oh, the camera yeah. moves too much, yeah. and it, it's not particularly appealing to look at. Great script, certainly. But but um, you, you want them to, you want to see the, the, like professional filmmakers step it up so that we're awed again. Yeah. So even though I don't particularly like Shape of Water as a movie, I find the technique awe-inspiring. Because yeah. it really is thought out. Del Toro really puts his heart and soul into this. And you go, this is a really well-crafted movie. Like, this is not just sort of phoning it in. He that's really, the word. He that's really the word. It. Craft. He's bringing the that's craft it. of filmmaking to bear yeah. uh, in the way that, uh, you know, a kid or a night. Uh, your your mm-hmm. average film student can't make this movie. Mm-hmm. Would, wouldn't, would, would not get no. this movie if they gave it an attempt. Yeah. Uh, across the board, production design, obviously, all of the sort of technical aspects of the movie, but frankly, they wouldn't get the performances either. No. I, th- when, I, when I say we don't particularly like it, I'm st- narrative. Only, yeah. only, only speaking about narrative. It's not a narrative. It's it's an insanely obvious narrative. Yeah. And I'm I mean, like, it, and I'm looking at this movie, and I'm thinking, this is a crap load of movie for the most obvious. You know. It, it look. It's it's. Uh, <coughs> thank you. The thing is, when we when we do uh, film week, you know, you got the little cough. Oh yeah, button. we yeah, don't you love, yeah. Like, like if we were in a real studio mm-hmm. with with uh, five million dollars worth of gear around us, we would have a little cough button which which silences you. And I may have to use that next week. <laughs> we, we, no, we're in the gangster studio. Uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, I, I always, you know, have you ever been there when Larry has used it? I don't think it's, so. He's such a pro. It's so elegant. He'll just sort of ask his question, and then as you do, as, and someone else starts talking, he'll push the button. He'll, <laughs> yeah, the, this little, this quiet little, <laughs> and it's just he's such a pro. It's we so, we are not. No, no, because <laughs> because even when I've used it in the past, you still hear it. Yeah, because it's like the the mic that's across the table <laughs> picks it up. You know, Larry is just such a pro. He knows where the sound is bouncing, and then those little, co- <laughs> so great. He's such a pro. Larry Larry Mantle is the uh. best. So anyway, um, the shape of water. Is is unbelievably great to look at on 4K. Uh, gave my wife her first dose of 4K the other day, and uh, it, it, it you know my wife does post production. You know she's yeah. she is metic- more meticulous than I am about how films look and so forth because she's she's an expert in in delivery and uh, and post production and uh, pretty much every aspect of even production. But you know she she knows sound, she knows picture, and uh, you know she knows when a, a film isn't timed right. And the fact that you you can look at a television set in 4K with somebody who has her eye, mm. and she's not seeing the pixels on the TV; she's seeing the grain in the film. Mm. That's mm. the beauty of it. Mm. That's where that's what you want out of it. So, yes, uh, I impressed my wife with 4K, and uh, I, that says everything you can. 
So, in any case, uh, even though we're not overly fond of the narrative of The Shape of Water, which is basically Beauty and the Beast with uh, a del Toro spin on it, which is here, I'm going to give you something romantic, and then I'm going to make it just a little bit grotesque and sexy, so it, yeah. so now you have to struggle with whether or not you want to like it, which is what he always does. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, I, it's, it's, look, it's, it's very clever. The grotesque and the beautiful. He finds the beauty in the grotesque, and he finds grotesque in beauty. Yeah, and, he, and, and, he and, he's, and, he's, and he's making us deal with it. You that know, is. He's, 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 he's been doing this for 20 years. For 20 years. 30 years. 30, 30 years, years, even, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, anyway, Shape of Water, there it is. Uh, 4K Ultra HD comes with a crap load of extras, too. Uh, tremendous sound on this, too, I should point out. This also has Movies Anywhere, so that you can add this to your Movies Anywhere account and uh, be very happy with that. Movies Anywhere, by the way, we should point out, has added yet another digital retailer to their uh, family. So Fandango Now oh. is part of it. So now you're you got Fandango now, and you got uh, Google Play, and uh, whatever else is on there. Yeah. Voodoo. Yeah. I mean, they're all part of it. So uh, the only old ultraviolet partners who are still kind of holding out, I guess, is uh, Lionsgate and HBO mm. and uh, Paramount. Mm. Those are the three holdouts. Paramount. Mm. Paramount should sign on soon, I would think. Uh, Lionsgate and HBO. I don't know what the holdout is there. Anyway, uh, so yeah, tons of extras on here, uh, mostly behind-the-scenes stuff uh, and, uh, and featurettes. But Guillermo del Toro's Masterclass, terrific, absolutely great. You definitely want to check that out. So um, fun stuff. And, of course, Movies Anywhere just makes it all worthwhile. 13 Academy Award nominations wound up winning uh, four awards, right? Four. Well, yeah, 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 you know. Right. It's, it's, look, it was a good, great yeah. movie. Um, but you know what's funny? Didn't mm. make nearly as much money as Jumanji. Yeah. Um, uh, which is, you know, people forget, you know, I mean, Black Panther sort of came yeah. in and wiped it. This was a gigantic, ridiculous hit. And and you know what? I'm going to say it, because even though when they announced this thing and they said, hey, we're doing another Jumanji, I said, you're out of your minds. The first one was hilarious. I love the first one. You don't need another Jumanji. Screw you. Go away. Uh, I said, it's going to be horrible. And then I heard, oh, yeah, and this, this, this one, they go into and the <laughs> game. And I said, even worse, you are idiots. This is stupid. Stop it! Don't do that. And then I heard that it was gonna, it was going to have the Rock, and I was mm -hmm. like, Oh yeah, of course it does, because everything <laughs> has to have the Rock these days. You suck. And then honestly, usually when I have that attitude to a movie, I'm I'm uh, right. Uh, I'm yeah. right. Yeah. In this case, I was wrong. Yeah. This movie rocks. This movie rocks. And and one of the reasons, or two of the reasons actually, is because of the Rock. Yeah. Dwayne. Uh. And and Kevin Hart. Mm -hmm. I'd be damned if those two guys are not so today's funny. just comedy team. You know, yeah. they're just funny because they were in the CIA movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And and they were already which had the which had the best tagline ever. Uh, what was it? Uh, a, a little. Uh, uh, a little, a little heart and a big Johnson. Yeah, that's great, man. <laughs> that's, 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 that's working it, baby. Yeah. And here it is, and they figured it out, and they flipped this thing. Uh, in the rest of Jack Black, of course, in the movie, it's good. It's just, a, it's just a neat movie. The, the Jonas Kid. Yeah, it's funny. It's sweet. Uh, and it worked. I saw, you know, I saw it for the show. Yeah, uh, and uh, and and I, you know, I had to go on the show and eat crow. Just yeah. like you, because I said everything you said. I here here's also where the, where the fun is. I mean, for, forget for a moment. There's kind of a tropic thunder quality to this as yeah. well, too. Yeah. We should yeah. point out it's it. It's sort of the the idea of people on like a a uh, a ragtag sort of jungle adventure and not adapting very well to all of the threats and. You know that's that's what they did in Tropic Thunder. It's not as funny as Tropic Thunder, but no. it has some. It gets some very good laughs. But what really makes it work, not the budget, not the effects, not the production value. It's the fact that those three actors in particular, and I don't want to take anything away from uh, from the, her. The, the, yeah, she's yeah, yeah, yeah. But but uh, the name, Gillian. Yeah, but but um, Johnson and Hart and Black. Uh, are basically doing a kind of Tom Hanks in Big thing, which yeah. is that they have to inhabit a different. You know, they they are playing the character that lives outside the game, inhabiting the character in the game. So there's that disconnect between soul and body, yeah. and you have to make the audience believe that you are someone trapped in a body that is not really yours. Yeah, yeah, and, and they're good at it, and they're so good at you it. You know, I mean, uh, Jack so Black uh, playing that girl. Uh, it, and, and it's about commitment. And by the way, that's acting, people. It when, is. You, when you when you when you see people do that and you and you buy it, yeah. those people can act and, and and never make fun of them again. I'm never going to make fun of Dwayne Johnson again. He's no. an excellent, excellent actor. He's such a good actor. Uh, and this uh, uh, 4K Ultra XD, all oh, everything you can possibly think of, games and this, that, and the other thing. So I mean, it's just a fun, fun movie to have, and it's one that will keep the kids occupied for hours upon hours. Tim, how do we feel about Star Wars: The Last Jedi? Well, you know, uh, we slammed it pretty good. We did a uh, we did a tomato slam. 
about that's that. right. We did, didn't we? Yeah, 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 yeah on, we on, did. With, and, with uh, Ray, you know, and like I always say, I like I like Star Wars every time I see it. <laughs> 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 and they've been making it for forty years, so I like that one. But you know, no, there are all kinds of issues with that. You guys, you guys were much more enamored of Adam Driver's performance than I was. I yeah, or I'm, maybe I, that's Ray. I think Ray is. Yeah. I was, and I'm less so now. I. Oh gosh! I mean, I had a problem with the last one. I have a I have a problem with the whole reboot. Um, Rogue anyway, one was the one that I've enjoyed the most because they had to abandon. Uh, you, yeah, you, that you, bored me too. That, that bored you too. That's the one yeah. that I enjoyed the most. I just, I, that's, I'm just not there yet, man. But but I'll be honest. I haven't really enjoyed any Star Wars movie since the uh, the Empire Strikes Back. <laughs> since, since the the Christmas special with uh, Chewbacca and his family. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, <laughs> I'm old enough to have, to have actually watched that and enjoyed it, <laughs> of course. Uh, which I'm ashamed of. Ugh. No, pretty much since Empire. I mean, uh, I, I don't even particularly like the original Star Wars. I kind of understand why everyone loves it. I, it was the last film I saw with my father. Mm. You know, he passed away about uh, 10 months later, 11 months later. So, I mean, I have a connection to it on that level. Mm. Uh, but, but, you know, Empire is it for me. That's the one. And that's the one I keep hoping that... At some point, you know, maybe in a hundred years they'll make one that measures up to that again. But that's the one that just kills it. it, it look, what I do love about these uh, the, this re- rebooted uh, series of films yeah. is Daisy Ridley. She's I, great. I, 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 she's fantastic. She's great. Uh, narrative. They're they're far far too contemporary. Adam Driver is far too contemporary. Um, I, I, I like Oscar Isaac as much as the next guy. I, but you know, Oscar he, Isaac is uh, he's like a second tier Han Solo. Yeah. They're they're not really giving him enough to do. To be honest, he has a few quippy one liners. But, but that's otherwise, why he, that, but that's the problem. You know, nothing yeah. to do. And um, when he is doing something, he's doing something to the guy from you know. I, Earth 2017, and, and I also feel I also feel like they're they're still underusing John Boyega. You know, he, haven't figured him out yet. I, I he they're trying to turn him into. It's sort of like they can't figure out who the Luke Skywalker is and who the Han Solo is, yeah. right? Like that was that was the dichotomy that always kept the series alive, which is this guy uh, Han Solo is a hero but doesn't really want to be. Luke Skywalker wants to be a, a hero but can't really rise to it, yeah. and somewhere between them. You know they have to sort of learn from each other, yeah. right? It's the mis- it's the it's the mismatched buddy cop thing a yeah. little bit, and uh, you know it's 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 Danny Glover and, and Mel Gibson and, and Lethal Weapon yeah. for for crying out loud, it really is. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, one of them is experienced and but just wants to be out of the out of the game, and the other one is it could learn a little bit from the other one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you know it, the the tension is 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 not unusual. We've seen it in many many movies before. It's 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 a common thing. However, here it's all over the map. Who's 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 our ascendant hero? Is it Daisy or is it is it John Boyega? And he, it kind of seems he, to be both. And in, in both of them disappear from the movie for you know extended Long, periods yeah. of movie. Yeah. Because very seldom are they in the movie together. He's usually looking for her, or trying yeah. to you know, or something like that. And, 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 and which means you know you have this sort of bifurcated sort of uh, 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 attention thing going on. My biggest problem with this movie is this: it's the middle film of a trilogy. And I don't think, despite all the big heads that have been working this through, all due respect to Lawrence Kasdan, who should know better, and to you know JJ, who apparently is doing too much else to, to really godfather this thing properly. Um, when you have a middle film in a trilogy, it has a very specific dramatic role to mm. play, and you saw that uh, in in Empire Strikes Back. Empire Strikes Back did a it complicated a lot of stuff. It took a lot of the story threads that appear in Star Wars, which didn't necessarily need resolution, and it stretches them out, and then it dead ends them with question marks. And it creates a lot of really complicated dilemmas, which is more or less what happens now in serialized television. Yeah. You know, you see that over the course of like, like let's take uh, Daredevil, right? I mean, a lot of that happens, you know, kind of at the end of every single episode of Daredevil. Imagine all that packed into a single center film. This entire movie, I guarantee you, when you watch episode uh, seven, and then you watch, eventually after it's done, you watch episode nine, Hmm. you will be able to watch episode seven and nine back to back with this movie not even mattering. Because it doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't go anywhere. Skip right over it, yeah. You can skip right over it. It's an incident that sort of is introduced randomly and then resolves and then goes away, and now we're going to continue the story. It's sort of like they're pushing pause, going over here, doing a thing, and now we're going to come back and carry on the story. It's a detour. Yeah. yeah. And it doesn't... It doesn't Which, it's, of course, you know, even, even, even 
<laughs> well, in a, in a certain way, Rogue One. Now I'm coughing. Yeah. In a certain way, Rogue One was was like. Uh, I, also, let's stop for a second. Think about this. We'll tell yeah. them this prequel yeah. story. Yeah. And you know, <laughs> and whatever. It's one of those. Um, anyway, yeah. tons of stuff on here. Uh, the uh, the bonus Blu-ray, which is not 4K, uh, has a. Um, uh, full length, uh, full length documentary with the uh, just c- that covers everything you could possibly want to know about this. It's not not terribly interesting to me, but uh, you also have scene breakdowns. Ryan Johnson, who directed it, has uh, does an audio commentary. Uh, there's a uh, little tidbit with uh, Andy Serkis and uh, some 14 deleted scenes that don't really do much either. So I mean, it's technically really really impressive. 4K is gorgeous. I just I can't get behind the movie. What are you gonna do? Hey, I don't know. Justice League here. Uh. Another 4K. Yeah, yeah. You know, gorgeous and all of that. Uh, but, you know, the movie, again. No. 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 You no. know, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Batman, uh, Batman, Wonder Woman, Cyborg, Aquaman. Uh, Wonder and, Woman and, gets and, is still yeah. the best thing in this movie, and she gets lost. And it's, she gets, you know, in, in the film, she gets lost behind, you know, Batman's. Uh, and I don't even understand why Aquaman is in this movie. None of it takes place underwater. No. He's like doing things on land, the, the you know, like throwing his trident and jumping. I. You know, isn't the whole point of Aquaman that he can like make whales do things and, and thing, bring well, the you, oceans you to bear? Watch that. You know, and something's happening under the water. Who's going to take care of that? Well, either need you know, Aquaman. Yeah. I don't need uh, I don't uh, need uh, Aquaman. Nemo, but I don't need Aquaman, Aquaman to like ride you know in, in a sidecar with me while I'm. You know, no, stay in the water, dude. Yeah, yeah. I, That's your these, thing. These movies, I, for you know, this whole this whole series of movies for me just they just never work for me. It's, it's, none of them. It's, it's all a problem. Zach, Zach Snyder stuff, and it just never worked. Uh, except for except for uh, Diana, except for Wonder Woman, she's Diana great. Prince, she, that, that, she's, she's great. But this she Flash is so much less interesting than Flash on TV. On TV, you know, so not even there, you know. And, and so you know, anyway, whatever. There it is. Uh, again, packed with all kinds of stuff because you know it's a DC Justice League with bonus scenes and, and <coughs> stuff. So you know, if, if fans are fans, and uh, and fans fans are going to want to definitely pick this up and check it out. Ah, uh, yeah, the, and the mustache is still a problem. <laughs> it is. It drives me crazy. It's all I look at. <sighs> oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. Uh, we got a thing here called, real quickly, a Peter Howitt film. Peter Howitt's been making movies a little while. Oh, yeah. Uh, directed a little straight to, straight to video thing. Uh, it's on Blu ray called Scorched Earth, which is basically just an action vehicle for uh, Gina Carano. I do like Gina Carano. Gina yeah. Carano, of course, was a, a, a mixed martial arts uh, champion. Uh, she is just lethal, but she's also gorgeous, and she does uh, she does very well for herself as an actress. She's been in a few things. She's been getting better as an actress. She was really and, good in the Soderbergh film. Yeah, like, that yeah, was the little, I, tight little Soderbergh yeah. film that she was on. And she's and she's terrific. I mean, she's got the look, she's got the skills, and she's she's honed her acting just well enough. She's certainly a better actress than Van Damme was ever an actor. <laughs> and uh, you know what? I mean, it's uh, it's good. Uh, it's good. You know, it's a little bit of a post-apocalyptic thing uh she's uh she's a bounty hunter and uh gets to kind of you know strut her stuff the production value is is adequate uh the script is adequate but she is a lot of fun to watch so uh and this is primarily a canadian film so uh, done with canadian tax credits and uh i tip my hat to him it's uh you know gina carana i hope i hope the best for her in her career indeed 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 when when the Starlight Ends is this lovely little film by uh, a little young director named Adam yeah. Sigmund. One of these lovely little movies uh, mostly takes place at a, at, a, at a bar. You got this writer. You got this girl that he was nuts and bananas about. Uh, was his muse mm-hmm. uh, and uh, and uh, you know drove his writing. And it came down uh, to, to choosing between uh, her and choosing something else. And he made a choice. Yep. And this movie is all just a reflection, a reflection on that choice uh, and whether or not he made the right choice, which is. Uh, the answer is uh, fairly obvious. <laughs> he did yeah. not. But nevertheless, it's a really sort of sweet little talky movie. David Arquette and a few other people. Uh, you know, not a lot of names. But I, I sometimes I just like little movies like this. You yeah. know, you, you, you put them on, you watch them. They're romantic. They're sweet. Uh, Arabella Oz uh, is the young woman in the movie. Just absolutely luminous. Whenever, you, whenever I see somebody like that, and they're really just luminous, and they can act. Uh, you know, I, I, I just, I, I, I wait, I wait to yeah. see if this town recognizes what I recognize. And uh, for her, I'm pretty sure that they will. Uh, so that's, uh, yeah, it's just a DVD, but it's neat. Here's another cool little DVD. It takes from within. This is from First Run Features uh, by a director named Lee Eubanks, and this is a great low budget, uh, really cool black and white kind of arty exploity film. 
The idea is that this was inspired by the movies of the 1960s of this same genre, and I'm going to I'm going to assume that that includes things like Carnival of Souls because ah. this feels like Carnival of Souls. Um, it's very sparse. It's a, it's about a man and a woman. This, this small little desolate town who are going to uh, go to a burial, and it is about what happens as that moment gets closer. And um, you know, it it, it definitely kind of splits the difference between. Uh, Carnival Souls mm. and uh, Repulsion, the Polanski oh, film. Yeah, Polanski. You know, it, it has that that ghostly, black and white, otherworldly, claustrophobic, creepy feel to it, and it's really well acted. It's really well shot. It's a it's a it's primarily an arty resume piece, but it's really worth checking out if you like those kinds of films. Comes with a director's commentary. Eubanks is totally open about what he's doing and, and trying to uh, trying to do. It's really interesting. Uh, so anyway, uh, Lee Eubanks. Um, uh, it takes from with. In. Definitely worth checking out from first run features on DVD and uh, look for look for Eubanks to really have something of a career going forward. It's very uh, interesting. Yeah, in, indeed, indeed. Um, uh, this remake of Murder on the Orient Express I thought was just freaking fabulous. I did too. You know, I did too. Just I, did, a I wrote my good movie. I wrote a review for CineGods.com. I thought it was great. Uh, Branna just absolutely nails it with this. They diddle yeah. around with the obviously everybody saw the original film uh, Murder on the Orient and obviously the, X is Christian and all that, but they diddle around with it a yeah. little bit. So. <laughs> you, you, doesn't matter if you've seen that. Uh, the there and uh, even despite the fact that and yeah. it's just beautiful and that mustache that <laughs> Brana, you know, which by the way has a SAG card. You can look you, yeah. you, that that mustache is just fantastic. And it's everybody great. in this movie is just killing it. Yep. Uh, 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 it it's it's it, it and it's funny. Uh, and and like I said, if you've read the Agatha Christie, if you know the other movie, doesn't make any difference. Watch this. You're going to land in a different place. Yes. Uh, and uh, but it's still perfectly perfectly reasonable uh they even make it reasonable that Lamar, uh, that leslie odom jr yeah is in this film they do which is uh, great which is just great perfectly it's reasonable terrific. perfectly yeah. reasonable um and and like i said a really gorgeous movie too uh, i thought that we might have been talking about it you know this past you know for one or two things um, um and, uh, maybe and, cinematography or something and, and it should have been for cinematography i want to uh, emphasize this was shot completely in 65 millimeter and you know what's really weird this annoys me a little bit there are certain movies – okay, so after Ryan's daughter won Best Cinematography in 1970, the David Lean film, mm. which was – that was the last big major studio film that was shot in 65, and the, and the format effectively died at that point and went away uh, until 1993 or four, whenever it was, when Far and Away mm. uh, was made in was, – was shot in 65. Bruce, that, Bruce I mean, and Kitman. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it was you know it was over twenty years before another movie was shot in natively in sixty five, and then Branna went and shot uh, uh, Hamlet mm -hmm. in sixty five, mm -hmm. fell in love with the format, and then we wound up getting uh, yeah. we also wound up getting uh, the uh, the Tarantino film, mm -hmm. uh, and then Hateful, uh, Eight. Uh, Hateful Eight, and then there have been a few films that shot partially in sixty five. Like uh, oh, with, the, with those big format changes, yeah. But 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 for, well, even even without it's like for example, uh, Paul Thomas Anderson when he did the the Master. Oh the yeah, Master is shot mostly in sixty five, but there are some handheld things that are shot thirty five, mm -hmm. so it doesn't count. And then even Dunkirk is shot tr significant parts of it, like a lot of his other stuff is is in you know IMAX sixty five, mm -hmm. but then he still shoots other things in thirty five. Mm -hmm. So but people rave, oh my gosh, he's shooting it. Nobody made mention of the fact that this thing was shot entirely Ireland. in 65. Yeah. Nobody mentioned it. And it's beautiful to look at. It's tremendous. So kudos to Branna for doing that and continuing to do that. Uh, it is a gorgeous-looking film. It totally opens up. The Sidney Lumet film was fun and but claustrophobic. Mm. And, you know, the television version from the Agatha Christie's Poirot with, with uh, Alan Suchet was, was, was fine. I mean, it, but not – this really opens it up. It's not claustrophobic. It has some action stuff. It has a great opening sequence in Jerusalem. It's a terrific film. And the 4K is just stunning to look at. It's stunning, stunning, stunning to look at. The, the, the 65, 70-millimeter uh, representation in 4K is just, uh, is just really beautiful. Commentary with Branna and uh, screenwriter Michael Green, who's terrific and has written a ton of stuff this last year. The guy is prolific and really good. Uh, and then some featurettes, deleted scenes. That's a lot of fun. And should point out, too, when uh, Nadim and I went to the LAFCA event for uh, Dunkirk, mm. we had a good little old long chat with, uh, with Branna. Oh. Yeah. And uh, and he was he at the time said yeah hoping to be able to do uh, Death on the Nile 
Ah. Which, of course, you know because of how the film ends. The film ends with a big, big old <laughs> Death on the Nile tease, which was his way of kind of holding out a carrot to uh, 20th Century Fox saying, you know, I dare you not to do it. But apparently, <clears throat> that as of about a month or two ago, that's, uh, that's green lit and we're going to get uh, Death on the Nile, which is an even better story. Yeah. Murder on the Orient Express is famous because of the ending. Yeah. But it's very claustrophobic. Death on the Nile is a scream. Yeah. It is just great. <coughs> so it, it calls uh, for, yes. for for that big scale production. And it'll be interesting because we haven't seen theatrically the same guy play Poirot in those two stories. We had Albert Finney in Murder on the Orient Express mm -hmm. and Peter Ustinov in Death on the Nile. Mm -hmm. So uh, Branagh has already shown that he can out ham. Uh, Finney <laughs> in playing the part with the beef and beef, like I got my mustache is bigger, <laughs> my accent is more pronounced and uh, I am the Poirot to be reckoned with. And so now he's going to take on Ustinov and yeah. I think that's going to be a lot of fun. I did, so long as he doesn't put on a fat suit. Let, you know, <laughs> no, play, play him skinny. Play him skinny, Kenneth. <laughs> play him skinny. Yes. Uh, you want to knock off a few guys? Oh, you know what? what? And let's let's do let's do. Uh, we have two giveaways this week. Oh, yeah. We're going to do the first of our two giveaways right now. We talked about downsizing last week, and uh, courtesy of Paramount, we are going to be giving away two bits of downs, uh, two packages of downsizing. Uh, so go ahead and email us at gods at digigods dot com. You can also email us at gods at cinegods dot com. That email is now working. Yes, gods at digigods dot com or gods at cinegods dot com. Either one. And uh, put Damon, D-A-M-O-N, in the uh, subject line. Make sure it gets to us by the 30th, March 30th. And um, uh, we will choose one person to receive a 4K Ultra HD of downsizing. And the other person will receive a big old cool package for downsizing that includes a fleece and a little cup. and a kind and, of stuff. And, and a, a bag and a hat and all kinds of just branded goodies and a whole it'll be a whole special downsizing special package. So not exactly an Oscar goodie bag, but nice nonetheless. Nice enough. So you'll get you'll get downsizing plus a lot of swag. So we'll uh, randomly pick one person to get the 4K, and the other ran person will be randomly chosen to get the 4K and all the swag. Uh, so send us uh, an email to gods or cine or gods at digigods.com or gods at cinegods.com with Damon in the subject line, and uh, we will choose the winner as long as we get it by the 30th so we our other giveaway we will do in a moment but let's do some docs all righty all righty one of which uh right out of the oscars again the recent oscar race again this is a wonderful anais varder and jr film faces yeah. and places i love this movie uh, it I, didn't I, win it, it did not um um uh which is fine but nevertheless it was a neat a neat movie um our i think it was our claudio puig who at the yeah. big uh, pre-oscar show did point out one thing about the film which I will mention here, which I don't know, for whatever reason, when I saw it and when I was uh, thinking about it and talking about it and writing about it over the course of the last season, it just never occurred to me. But, but Claudia pointed out that there are nothing but white faces in this film. Yeah. Uh, sure. And it's it's just, it's it, it, it is it, in rural it, France. In rural France. Now, yeah. it, and of course, you know, because you speak French, yeah. that the actual title of this film was, was Faces and Villages. Yes. Villages. Yeah. Right? Uh, it, it's, and it meant villages. That's where, that's yeah. where they're, they're in rural France, traveling around yeah. the villages, you know? So, yeah, yeah, it's true what, it's true what she says. Yeah. Uh, but nevertheless, <clears throat> I, it never it did not strike me at all until Claudia said it, and I had and I had been thinking about this film for three months. You know, I mean, and the thing we we do have to remember is it, it, it and that is partly a problem with the uh, with the title that they gave it here to some degree. But uh, you know, Varda has been a primarily in her career a chronicler of um, a particular part of French culture. You know, she has not been a chronicler of Parisian culture. Mm. Let's put it that way. She's been a chronicler of of uh, the the culture of the people who are often very very often left out of the perception of France, uh, you know the gleaners and I right. She, mm. she the, the people who do the dirty work, the field work, the people who live in villages who don't ever get a spotlight shined on them. You know it's a uh, it's the it's the the lost part of France, uh, the the sort of the earthier part of France, the peasantry mm. is what we might have called it. Uh, you know, three hundred years ago, and she likes to shine a spotlight on those people. And and uh, in, in here, it's what's touching to me is these people who see themselves suddenly centered in, on the artwork of these two, you know, a yeah. filmmaker and a, and a photographer muralist come to their small village and take pictures of them and immortalize them on the sides of buildings and yeah. barns and walls. 
and they cry and yeah. they're touched. And it's, uh, you know, what I take away from this is that um, art can be meaningful in all kinds of ways that we don't expect it to be meaningful and in places we don't, and to people that we don't necessarily expect. Yeah, and, and, and of course there is the art in this <coughs> film, the actual physical <coughs> art that they are creating as they roll around in this van with this camera yeah. and take these pictures and do this physical art. Uh, and then, of course, there, there is this the thing too. This yeah. the people, the, what they are doing, yeah. uh, is 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 a, is a part of the thing, which is why uh, the film is an extraordinary film. Uh, the Los Angeles Film uh, Critics Association did give it; uh, it yep. was the winner there. It was. It was uh, our our documentary winner uh, yeah. choice. So you know, uh, we got it right too. Cohen Media Group. It's really a lovely film. Faces places. So, uh, kind of in the vein of Hoop Dreams, a little bit is a doc called Quest. I uh, I mean, covered this for uh, Film Week. This one has won a ton of documentary awards by a director named Jonathan Olszewski. Uh, this is a really, really profoundly touching movie. Uh, I, I, I don't want to give anything away. It, it basically follows there's a, uh, there's a black family uh, in Philadelphia who allowed the filmmakers to enter their lives for about a solid decade. Mm. It covers the period of the Obama presidency and a little, a little bit outside of it. And it is a look at exactly how this family is impacted just by events large and small over the course of this decade. And um, it, it begins, I think, with an idea that there's going to be some kind of a sort of global consideration to this. Uh, that somehow what's happening in the, in the broader culture, in the broader political world, in yeah. the world in general, that that's how, what's really going to affect this family. And what you eventually find out is, uh, in both positive and incredibly tragic ways, uh, that what really affects them is pretty much local. Yeah. And that their world, uh, like all of our worlds, really are we can we can pretend that that the, the, the what's happening a continent away or even you know a state away really really impacts us. But ultimately, what impacts us is what's happening ten minutes away or five minutes away on any given day, and. Um, the uh, it, it's really interesting, and this is you know it's a very interesting family too. The uh, the father is a uh, a music producer, and uh, yeah, the Quest is this is DJ name or yeah, or, or, yeah. or, or, or a hip hop name. It's, yes, that's his name. Yeah, yeah, but but he's you know his job is to sort of find these up and coming hip hop artists and to kind of hone their careers and help them find their sound and their voice. And uh, it, it really is uh, – it's an extraordinary look at, uh, at, at just the things that really do impact you as a family uh, – at individuals and families over a period of time. And to sort of compress those 10 years into, into one film, as has been done in other films, you know, we think of certainly the, uh, the Michael Apted, 7-Up oh, yeah, and 28-Up, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, those yeah. things which take a much more – much broader – scope but uh 10 years compressed into a into a sh into a feature length film is uh, is very powerful yeah and and and, and in that film uh, it, it become uh, the, the thing about it is uh, oh, or the longer that the cameras are there the the more they become a part of the scene yeah uh, and the more real everything becomes yeah uh, and and the less affected everything is and it's really yeah. quite powerful dolores uh, uh dolores hurtup yeah. Uh, uh, who, of course, was the uh, uh, the uh, <coughs> farm workers advocate for years and years and years and years. It's very it's, it's an interesting thing. Probably growing up in St. Louis uh, in the late '60s, early '70s, uh, uh, two people who actually represented California to me as much as anything that I saw on television. You know, uh, were uh, Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta. Because yep. you would see them on television in St. Louis, the grape, uh, the farm workers strike with the grapes. And what is that? The seven? It was in the seventies, right? Yeah. The boycott. Yes. I, but my family participated in the grape boycott yep. of the nineteen seventies because of this little woman. Well, anyway, this is a wonderful documentary that basically just covers her life, an extremely interesting life. She's still alive, of course. Yeah. Uh, and she powerful. always she always kind of gets left out of the conversation a little yeah. bit. It's all Caesar and not yeah, not Dolores, but well, this it, it, this uh, re remedies that it remedies that, and, and it needed to be remedied. She yeah. is, she uh, she was a driving force behind that, and she's an interesting character too. Uh, she's she's a woman who had uh, several children uh, by more than a, a, yeah. a couple men. Yeah. Uh, 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 and uh, it, it never apologetic about that in any context whatsoever. Uh, left your children behind quite often to go do this very important work, uh, and has never been particularly apologetic about that. Her children show up in this movie, and, and they they were okay with what mom had to do, and are very happy about the legacy that she's left. Anyway, it's a, a, a quite an extraordinary uh, film, uh, and people should check it out because everyone should simply know who Dolores Herta was, is, is, is. 
A uh, couple of a uh, couple of really interesting docs here. One, uh, I'm going to mention these in the same breath because, and you'll see why. So the first one is uh, the Paris Opera by Jean Stéphane Bron. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, still struggling with that coughing, uh, which is uh, just a straight, wonderful, wonderful look uh, of the at the Paris Opera. And uh, which is an extraordinary uh, institution globally, highly respected, and uh, looks goes delves right into the individual storylines of the uh, the artists and uh, the people who run the opera, and uh, it is uh, you know what it what it takes to make it all come together just day after day and month after month. Really very impressive, and uh, just a, a look at the at at, w- at at precisely how monumental it is to run a uh, a performing arts institution that just period mm. much less one that has a reputation that just uh, is through the roof so the paris opera is really quite an extraordinary effort and uh, and beautifully done and if you've you know if you've been to paris you understand the role the opera plays there in the city it's just there are two opera houses the old and the new and it's it's just a it's not like here it's not like here and the other one a uh, complete flip side of the coin is Rebels on Point, point spelled with an E at the end, Les Ballets Trocadero de Monte Carlo. Now, Les Ballets Trocadero de Monte Carlo may sound like a foreign ballet. It is, in fact, not. This is the very, very famous uh, drag ballet in New York City, which was uh, created after the Stonewall Riots and has become kind of a cultural touchstone for the uh, gay community in New York. It is, these are men in drag performing ballet. And uh, and a lot of other things other than ballet, and uh, it is beyond beyond any kind of political or social import. Uh, this thing is tremendously entertaining. Yeah, this will have you in a fetal position, laughing yourself delirious at at least three or four places. Um, intentionally. I yeah. mean, it is truly, truly tremendous. Uh, it's a really wonderful doc. It, this has also won a whole bunch of awards, and uh, it is, it's really, really worth checking out. comes with more extras than the movie. They're, 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 the movie itself is 90 minutes. There are over two hours of extras and all kinds of behind-the-scenes stuff. I mean, they really loaded it up. So this is, uh, this is just a, a really tremendous purchase uh, on DVD, Rebels on Point. Uh, by the filmmaker Bobby Joe Hart. Well done, Bobby. Good beautiful, job. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. Uh, who killed Tupac? Interestingly, waiting. <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> you know, it's funny. We 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 saw we we I, we we. Uh, How can we talk about this without talking about it? <clears throat> we can't talk about. We it. We can't talk about it. So we we there's a reason why we can't talk about this, but uh, we've been talking about. Now this. you know we're a part of the whole damn thing. We okay. know who killed Tupac. Damn it! <laughs> they, so, they might come after us. Yeah, we 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 are we we have to sort of. Uh, well, anyway. Well, we have a documentary here. Who killed Tupac? Tupac Shakur, nineteen seventy one to nineteen ninety six. Nineteen ninety two. Uh, Tupac was in his uh, debut film, uh, yeah. Juice, directed by Ernest Dickerson. I interviewed him over in Westwood. Yeah. Um, uh, early, early that. Yeah. I sat down with that young man, and we had a most fascinating conversation. Mostly, uh, I mean, it was a normal conversation uh, interview with young men, uh, you know, in their in their movies. Him, Omar Epps, uh, Ernest Dickerson, all of those. But I talked with Tupac that day. He absolutely mesmerized me for a number of reasons. I'm going to write a piece about that I'm going to put up on uh, Synagogue. Uh, But little did I know in 1992 that that kid would be dead in four years, Um, uh, leaving behind quite a legacy of music, obviously, a few good films. Gridlocked, by the way, is his best performance, if you've never seen. And he was was in the the Mickey Rourke film Bullet, which my wife worked on. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. But there it is. And, of course, uh, his, his, his murder is still unsolved. Uh, civil rights attorney, and I think former, I think formerly uh, head of the NAACP, Benjamin Crump, yeah, uh, leads the investigation in this documentary here. Uh, yeah. uh, evidence, this, that, and the other thing. Um, and uh, you look uh, interesting. Uh, and now that we know the things that we know because Here's of this thing that we did, yes. it makes what's in this film all the more interesting. It to makes me. it so much more interesting. And le- and I will I will end with this. This this is. The subject of Tupac's death and everything related to it Mm -hmm. is going to become a topic of conversation again very, very soon. Yeah, yeah. One of the reasons why I'm going to write my essay is because of that. Uh, By the way, um, Tupac Shakur, I was a big fan. 
Uh, oh, tremendous. I, 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 you know, him, his mom, um, um, uh, yeah, 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 all kinds of things to be critical of Tupac Shakur about. All kinds of things. All kinds of things. So I'm yeah. not Pollyanna about it. <clears throat> but, but there was something about this kid that was extraordinary. You know what? Great artists are – well-adjusted people don't become artists. No. And the reason that great art very often emerges from the most troubled and the most uh, tumultuous of people is because it is medicinal. It is how they cope with things that other people just kind of keep pushed inside. And it's why poetry and painting and music speaks to us. Mm. And the greatest, the, the, you always notice the best hip hop artists are the ones who really come from the most messed up backgrounds. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you know, Tupac and... Biggie, uh, of course. And, 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 and certainly uh, and, Biggie. And a lot of our L.A. Guy kids, the game, uh, I mean, uh, the Eminem, harder... The Eminem. Harder, Eminem, the harder they're lied by Curtis Jackson, uh, 50 yeah. Cent. Yeah. Uh, the, har the, the more... And of course, this is true. N.W.A. Yeah, this is true in, yeah. all, in, in, all, in, in all of the art. It's just absolutely true. Yeah. Uh, Tupac, it, for me, and this, this is going to be a big statement, Muhammad Ali, yeah. Jim Brown, Richard Pryor, and Tupac Shakur... Uh, my dad, not Richard yeah. Andy, are the black men, the, the only black men that I've ever known who say exactly what the hell they're thinking. <laughs> True. Those are the ones. Yeah. Muhammad Ali, Jim Brown, Richard Pryor, and Tupac Shakur. Yeah. They, some, what they were thinking was sometimes crazy. Uh, uh, but you know but what? But they said it. They said it. Yeah. yeah. Gotta love yeah. that. And from public television is Movable Feast with Fine Cooking Season 5, this time with uh, Pete Evans and Curtis Stone uh, are the chefs for, who co-host this season. Uh, you know what? It's just, it's really, really great. And there are tons of other chefs on here and amazing dishes and, uh, you go all over the world and it's just, it's just gonna, it's just gonna make you want to cook and eat uh, until you explode. It is a lot of fun. It is a, it's a travel show and it's a, it's a great documentary show and it's a cooking show and it's just so much fun to watch. If you love food and I love food and if you love the world, you love the world, you're going to love it. It's Can't really great. Can't go wrong with that. Uh, Frank Serpico documentary, two story. Frank Serpico, of course, Al Pacino Serpico. Yeah. Uh, 1970s cop, corruption in the uh, NYPD. He put it all yep. on the line. Yep. Uh, the, the, apparently they tried to take him out. Anyway, this is a doc. First of all, Frank looks great. Uh, he does. Uh, uh, you know, uh, and yeah. yeah, and yes, he's still alive. Uh, and was under uh, cover, uh, or what do they call it, uh, uh, witness protection yeah. for years and years and yep. years and years. So, you know, in, in his own words here, uh, that whole period, John Turturro, yeah. uh, one of the voices in the film, neat documentary about Frank Serpico. Legend of the American Sniper on Blu-ray. Uh, this is from Mill Creek. Uh, you know, if you, I this, it's funny that this comes at a time when we're having a real conversation about guns, uh, so it may not go down well with a lot of people, but you know what? Um, snipers have been a part of the military for centuries. I know we associate this as kind of a uh, part of the era of uh, scopes and lasers, but there, have been, there, were, there were snipers during the American Revolution as well. And uh, it's really it's a, it's quite a fascinating uh, thing to look at. In any case, this is um, this is a this explores the world of the sniper, especially the modern sniper in particular, uh, in a uh, in a very uh, non-judgmental way. It's uh, uh, th only 92 minutes long, so it doesn't it doesn't go into all of the historical nuance that I might have liked, but. Uh, it's still pretty insightful. It's on Blu-ray. It looks really good. It's put to, well put together. And again, not judgmental. It's tough to look at, but um, very insightful. Very and interesting. It's a thing that's true in the world. Miss yep. Kiet's Children. This is just the most extraordinarily beautiful movie. Uh, so there's uh, in, in Holland, there are all these refugee children coming in from all over the world, lots of different places. And uh, most of these children obviously don't speak the language. Sometimes they don't even speak each other's language. This teacher, this extraordinary teacher, takes these children into her classroom. Little kids, we're talking about five, six, seven years old, uh, who uh, she doesn't speak their language, they don't speak hers, they sometimes don't speak each other's, and she teaches these children. Uh, and she uh, allows these children to blossom and grow, and it's just the most beautiful thing in the world. The way this doc works is fantastic, too. Without a single interview or any narration or anything, the doc is just, the, the, the film is just a fly on the wall watching her and watching these children, four, four children in particular that they're following. And what happens is just a fascinating, fascinating thing, and this is why I love teachers. They're the most, yeah, these, no language uh, it passes between them that's understood, mm. yet, yet she wins. Love it, baby. That is. 
Uh, and then uh, the last doc, and then we, we'll cover just a couple of uh, other things with one more giveaway before we lock the show up. Tolkien and Lewis, Myth, Imagination, and the Quest for Meaning. This was shown on uh, public television, and this is a wonderful, wonderful doc. Yeah. It's only 60 minutes long. It blows by. It's probably a little bit too brisk for, for the story it tries to tell. It should be called Tolkien and Lewis and Dyson, mm. because the pivotal event here is a dinner in 1931 when uh, C.S. Lewis had dinner with J.R., his buddy, Tolkien. Can you imagine? <laughs> you, you, what an interesting dinner. You're thinking they're talking about, you know, dwarves and elves and other worlds, and they're probably just sitting around, you know, just <gasps> moaning about Hitler or something. But um, the, uh, anyway, 1931, C.S. Lewis, J.R. Tolkien, and Hugo Dyson, another mm-hmm. very uh, esteemed individual of the era, uh, had dinner together. And it was a, apparently a very intense philosophical discussion that wound up moving C.S. Lewis, who's widely acknowledged as one of the, the foremost champ, you know, apologetic champions of Christianity, mm. who at the time was an atheist. And it moved him from a position of not having faith to a position of having faith, from which, of course, sprang some of his greatest yeah. works, both yeah. fiction and nonfiction, including the Chronicles of Narnia. And uh, all of that was largely as a result of Tolkien, who was you know, a fervent believer, a- as was Dyson. And th- from there, the documentarians also used this as a, as a launching point to sort of talk to a, l- a host of other contemporary scholars about what gives life meaning. Is it religion? Is it not religion? Is it philosophy? Is it not philosophy? And all of this. It really gets into the, the whole subject of where do we find meaning and validation in life. And it's quite interesting, although I wish it had been twice as long. Mm. I really do. I wish it had been twice as long. But still, Tolkien and Lewis, uh, Myth, Imagination, and the Quest for Meaning is uh, quite interesting. So here's where we're going to go out. we got one more giveaway here. The new uh, Tomb Raider movie is out and apparently not very good. No. So I haven't seen it. You have. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Which is why it's it's nice that we're giving these away. And so we are – what's also out now, kind of piggybacking on that new movie in which we'll remind people that it was done better the first time around. 2001, I think, was the first one. Yeah, Lara Croft Tomb Raider and Lara Croft Tomb Raider, The Cradle of Life, its sequel. Uh, Both have been reissued by Paramount in uh, 4K Ultra HD editions and one very lucky person mm. who sends us an email and if you apply for the other one too we're not going you're not going to get to win downsizing and Lara Croft but you can apply for both and you can you know you can enter for both and and uh, and and take whatever you win if you win anything um, send an email to us at godsatdigigods.com or godsatcinegods.com and uh, put Croft, yes. C R O F T, Croft in the subject line. Make sure it gets to us by the thirtieth, and you will win both a 4K uh, Ultra HD of uh, Lara Croft Tomb Raider and Tomb Raider: uh, The Cradle of Life. These also come with um, ultraviolet on them. Remember, Paramount has not signed on to movies anywhere. It is still an ultraviolet platform. So you get ultraviolet on this. You get uh, gobs of uh, extras on here, including uh, Simon West doing the commentary on the first Tomb Raider and uh, Jan de Bont doing the commentary on the sequel. Jan, uh, I forgot about him. You even get Gerard Butler's doing a screen test in the sequel, uh, <laughs> which is hysterical. And uh, there are featurettes and deleted scenes. There's a YouTube music video. There's a ton of stuff on all of these. Uh, the movies themselves, they look good. I don't, I don't think they, they look brilliant uh, as far as 4K necessarily, but they, you know, it, it's, it looks better than Blu-ray for sure. And uh, I, I guess, the, the, you know, I, I, I'm kind of nostalgic for these movies in a way. I never played the game, never nah, had nah. any interest in it. Nah. But Angelina Jolie is terrific. Oh, she, she, she's, and, and it's funny, the one good thing about the new one, by the way, is Alicia Vikander. She's the yeah. only good thing about the movie. It's just a ridiculous But I movie. guess it's more, it's too, it hues too closely to the new version of the game, is what some people have said. I get, it was, you know, and, and again, don't know anything about the game. The yeah. thing that I will say about this, somebody, somebody was saying, well, yeah, how come they get, didn't get Angelina there? How come, how come, how come they didn't bring mm. Angelina back? Because She's fifty. <laughs> That's why, and she's directing now. Yeah, yeah, she's a whole different life. All that kind of wacky guys. Whole different, different life. Guys. No, it's not. And here we're going to go out with uh, two Criterion editions this week. Two really, really terrific Criterion editions that uh, you may not have expected. Uh, the first one is from 1930. This is going all the way back, really, really early sound era. Just, I mean, it, it's th- this is right when musicals are trying to figure out how we're going to merge musicals, you know, uh, sync sound musicals with, with cinema. This is uh, Paul Whiteman and his band in mm-hmm. King of Jazz, yeah. directed by John Murray Anderson. Now, 
if you're thinking, I don't know who Paul Whiteman was, neither did I. Yeah, yeah. If you're thinking, I've never heard of a filmmaker named John Murray Anderson, neither did I. I never even heard of this film. Uh, but Criterion very often gives us medicine that is good for us, mm. whether or not we want it. Yeah. And uh, it's really, really interesting. Paul Whiteman was a band leader oh, yeah. who was called a king of jazz at the time. Did you know about Paul Whiteman? Oh, yeah. See, now you're, you, well, you're, you're jazz. You come from a jazz yeah, family. Yeah, my, yeah. So, so uh, Paul Whiteman was a big deal, I guess, at the time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, huge, huge, huge Paul Whiteman, yeah. Uh, and and so you have a whole bunch of, you know, like, there, there's just a whole lot of, like, a young Bing Crosby uh, shows up here. And, and there's just a, it's it's really, it's 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 quite an, it's it's really very interesting to see how this all kind of came together. You know, it's a, it's a snapshot in time. It's a musical snapshot. If, it's If it, you watched a lot of people, for folks who watched a lot of Boardwalk Empire, yeah. you, you heard, you were listening to a lot of Paul White. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, there's a lot of Paul White. Well, there. anyway, this is such an interesting uh, historical snapshot of music, of cinema, of a particular point in time. It's just, it's a, it's a culture in transition and yeah. it's really, really interesting. And it's a culture where, a culture where the races are crossing over uh, in, yeah. in, in, in ways that they're not crossing over anywhere else. Anywhere else. Yeah. Yeah. And then the other one is Ken Russell's Women in Love. That is right, ladies and gentlemen. Ken Russell has been dubbed by Criterion. Uh, <laughs> that is as good as being knighted He's in, so in crazy. some world. He's so Ken crazy. Russell has, has gotten the Criterion treatment. He Again, he might as well have received a knighthood. Uh, and this is about uh, as interesting a Ken Russell film from the era as you will ever see. This is from 1969, adapting D.H. Lawrence. And D.H. Lawrence was already, like, pushing the envelope, and Ken Russell pushes it all the way until it explodes. Uh, this is a tremendous movie. Alan Bates and Oliver Reed are just amazing. Glenda Jackson is through the roof yeah. amazing in this. Uh, it, is, it is daring. It is sexual. It is audacious. Uh, it's just a tremendous movie. Women in Love from Criterion with gobs of extras, including uh, interviews. And uh, it, Billy Williams, the cinematographer, is even interviewed. Billy Williams, who yeah. la would later shoot Gandhi. I mean, it's really, really tremendous. Uh, you're just, you even get, you even get a really interesting 2007 interview with Ken Russell, which is really weird. Have you ever, have you, ever, it was you or Mark that had the great, crazy Ken Russell story? Oh yeah, was we've that, told it on this show you've before. Told, okay, good. We've told it before. We'll, we'll lay off. Anyway, that is it for this week. We'll see you guys next week. Send us emails with Croft or the Lara Croft Tomb Raider 4K giveaway in the subject line. Get it to us by the 30th. And Damon, D-A-M-O-N, to win one of the two 4K packs for downsizing to gods at digigods.com or gods at cinegods.com by the 30th. See you next week.